the more we put up in space, the more at risk our communication, our space-based technology is. Can humans fly out of the solar system? To a large extent, everyone is worried about this question. Many believed that Voyager had departed the solar system after more than 40 years since Voyager 1 and Voyager 2 departed from Earth. But that couldn't be further from the truth. Having said that, the solar wind is far from an ally. A violent conflict between solar wind and interstellar rays rages at the boundary of our solar system. According to scientists, the firewall is the biggest problem that Voyager has faced so far on its journey beyond the solar system. The firewall is a wall that is 89,000 degrees Fahrenheit in temperature and is invisible. Is it possible for Voyager 2 to leave the solar system and reach other planets? Even so, are we safe from the firewall's threats? Join us as we explore how Voyager 2 discovers the wall of fire at the edge of the solar system. Think of it this way. When you turn on the faucet over a sink, the water pouring out of the faucet creates a little pool that the water sitting in the bowl can't reach. It turns out that the sun is similar to a faucet in that it releases solar wind in all directions rather than water. Additionally, instead of standing water, the sun surrounds itself with a particle soup composed of interstellar plasma. We know the sun to be a star that constantly emits heat from nuclear fusion. Massive quantities of energetic particles are released into space during a nuclear fusion reaction. These particles will eventually dissipate, much like the sun. The solar particles are constantly slowed down by the sun's gravity, which stops them from traveling any farther. Therefore, solar particles can only travel up to 47 million miles, or 120 astronomical units, before colliding with an intense particle wall. The sun's active layer acts as a protective barrier for the planets in our solar system by preventing cosmic rays from entering the solar system. This may be good for the sun, but it makes it very difficult for people to travel out of the solar system. Although this dynamic has been known to scientists for some time, it was recently revealed by the Voyager 2 spacecraft that the area surrounding our solar wind shield which collides with interstellar plasma soup is actually a wall of fire consisting of low-density plasma at 89,000 degrees Fahrenheit. Think of it as an actual physical-physical barrier that almost jumps up as soon as we enter what is referred to as interstellar space. This wall of fire consists of extremely hot plasma with temperatures ranging from about 53,000 to 89,000 degrees Fahrenheit. The entire solar system is encased in an energetic bubble formed by the solar wind as it blasts forth in all directions, stretching billions of miles. The heliopause is a thick, hot wall of plasma that forms at the boundary of this bubble, where the solar wind finally meets the intense cosmic rays that are shooting through interstellar space. Located around 120 times farther from the Sun than Earth, this cosmic boundary serves to redirect and weaken the intense radiation emitted by faraway stars and galactic explosions. Using data acquired by NASA's Voyager 2 spacecraft, which traversed the heliopause and entered interstellar space, astronomers conducted a number of studies that directly examined this cosmic frontier for the first time. Despite Voyager 2's smooth passage over the heliopause in under 24 hours, scientists have discovered that the plasma barrier is far hotter and thicker than earlier estimates suggested. This means that it physically separates our solar system from interstellar space. This screen prevents approximately 70% of cosmic radiation from entering our solar system, according to Edward Stone, an astronomer at the California Institute of Technology who has been involved with the Voyager program since its debut in 1977. Solar wind and space wind, both generated by supernova explosions that occurred millions of years ago, meet at the heliopause. Approximately one third of the external environment is able to enter the bubble. In November 2018, NASA's Voyager 2 satellite passed through the heliopause, becoming only the second man-made object in history 
to leave our solar system. The satellite's twin, Voyager 1, became the first in August 2012. However, a sensor failure prevented it from conducting a complete border analysis. Voyager 2's radiation data from its interstellar voyage shows that the heliopause could reach high temperatures almost twice as hot as what previous astronomical models predicted. This indicates that the solar wind and cosmic rays collided far more violently than scientists had anticipated. Researchers discovered that the heliopause's limits are not as uniform as expected, despite the fact that the heliopause's hot, thick plasma wall shields our solar system from most of the dangerous rays dashing across space. There are some permeable pores near the heliopause's edge that let interstellar radiation seep in, so it's not a perfect bubble after all. On our side of the heliopause, data from Voyager 2 revealed two such holes where radiation levels rose significantly higher than background levels before tumbling back down. When cosmic radiation levels finally spiked and remained high, Voyager 2 had clearly entered a new space area outside of the solar system. Our host star's massive matter and energy jets extended outward for an extensive period after departing from the Sun, which was well outside Pluto's orbit. On the other hand, as time goes on, they become less effective at repulsion of the dust and other matter floating within the galactic walls as well as the thin, mysterious material within those same walls. The Parker Solar Probe Project, named after the renowned astronomer who first postulated the solar wind's existence, is part of NASA's ongoing solar system exploration program. According to the University of Chicago, Parker came up with the idea that the sun's superheated corona might theoretically release charged particles at high speeds while he was an assistant professor there in 1957. Solar physicists still don't have a firm grasp on the reason for the sun's superheating, which remains a perplexing and enigmatic feature of the sun's activity. Plasma in the sun's corona is constantly heated, according to Parker's idea, and can reach scorching temperatures of 3.5 million degrees Fahrenheit. As the plasma reaches a certain temperature, it is released into space as the solar wind, carrying the sun's magnetic field with it when the sun's gravity is unable to contain it any longer. According to what Parker remembered in 2018, his theory was heavily contested back then. Finally, astronomer Subramanian Chandrasekhar, who would go on to become the namesake of NASA's Chandra X-ray Observatory, provided support for this notion. Despite Chandrasekhar's distaste for the particle concept, he agreed with Parker's theory as his maths were flawless. Along with its continuous streams of solar wind, the Sun occasionally releases large amounts of these charged particles all at once. These occurrences, called coronal mass ejections, have the potential to set off geomagnetic storms in our solar system. These storms are responsible for the mesmerizing aurora borealis displays, but they also have the potential to disrupt power grids communication networks, and satellites in Earth's orbit. The vast heliosphere sweeps across the solar system well beyond Pluto's orbit. A lengthy windsock is the best way to describe the heliosphere's shape as it follows the Sun's path, says NASA. The European Space Agency has said that, at its nearest point, the heliosphere extends around 100 astronomical units from the Sun. Cosmic rays are energetic particles that can harm living cells. The heliosphere protects humans from these dangerous rays. The source of cosmic rays is beyond our solar system, and they travel at nearly the speed of light. These atoms, with their tremendous energy, would continue to pelt Earth in the absence of our protective bubble. If the heliosphere hadn't formed, life on Earth might have changed drastically if it had evolved at all. Even though the sun's wind is always blowing, its density and speed change during the course of the sun's 11-year cycle of activity. Throughout this cycle, the sun's energy output, the number of sunspots, and the amount of material that is ejected all rise and fall. Sunspots change the solar wind's magnetic field strength, velocity, temperature, and density, among other characteristics. The average constant solar wind speed at Earth 
is around 190 miles per second. The solar wind travels at an average speed of 0.87 million miles per hour. A Category 5 hurricane can top 150 miles per hour. The spacecraft Mariner 2 was able to detect solar wind and distinguish between two different streams, one rapid and one slow, during its approach to Venus. The NASA-reported sluggish stream was moving at approximately 215 miles per second, whereas the fast stream was seen zipping by at double that speed. In 1973, X-ray pictures of the solar corona obtained by Skylab were used to determine the source of the rapid solar wind stream. Coronal holes are cooler areas of the Sun that have an open structure of magnetic field lines, which is what causes the solar wind to be so fast. Coronal mass ejection occurrences have the potential to produce solar winds that are unusually rapid. Wind speeds over 600 miles per second have been recorded during coronal mass ejections. Although certain solar wind streams reach astonishingly high speeds, it is the slower solar wind that has scientists baffled. The sluggish solar wind is more mysterious for several reasons. Launched in 1990, NASA's Ulysses spacecraft has already provided some hints as to where the sluggish wind stream originated as it circled the sun's poles. During solar minimums, the study discovered that the solar wind mainly comes from the sun's equator. A mixed inhomogeneous flow characterizes the solar wind as the solar cycle approaches its maximum, replacing the two distinct regimes of a fast wind at the poles and a slow wind at the equator. Our whirling star has an impact on every solar system body. According to NASA Headquarters Division Director for Heliophysics, Nikki Fox, my feeling is, if the sun sneezes, Earth catches a cold, meaning that the solar wind ensures that Earth feels the effects of the sun's activities. Could Earth be hit by a solar storm? If so, what would happen? Coronal mass ejections and solar flares are examples of solar storms that cause the sun to produce energetic particle streams and large gas bubbles that are interwoven with lines of magnetic fields and released into space. These cyclones can carry particles hurtling toward Earth at incredible speeds, and they frequently coincide with sunspot cycles. The northern and southern lights, or aurora, are the product of geomagnetic storms caused by these particles colliding with Earth's magnetic field. Satellites, electrical grids and communication networks are all vulnerable to their dangers though. Some solar storms are weak and have little impact, while others can be quite powerful and cause major technological disruptions by affecting Earth's magnetosphere and ionosphere. The National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration established the NOAA Space Weather Scales as a standardized method for rating the intensity of geomagnetic storms and other space weather occurrences. The National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration's tornado and hurricane scales give a clear framework for assessing the possible effects of these astronomical upsets on Earth and its technological infrastructure. Based on the visibility of auroras at various geographical latitudes and the potential impact on power systems, satellite operations, and other technical systems, the scale spans from one, which is minimal, to an extreme of five. Now we can travel through time to the 19th century and investigate the effects of the worst solar storm that has ever been recorded on our planet. It was just another ordinary morning. Ascending the flight of stairs to an amateur observatory housed within his rural London estate, Richard Carrington turned the lever to open the shuttered dome and pointed a big brass telescope towards a bright blue sky. He made a note of the time and proceeded to draw a cluster of enormous sunspots as they became visible. Before his very eyes, two flashes of light materialized, grew and blossomed as he did so. The dazzling flares dissipated five minutes after that. Unbeknownst to Carrington at the time, he had just witnessed the greatest solar flare that the contemporary era had seen. The white light solar flare, which would one day be named after Carrington, was really a surface magnetic explosion on the sun. 
Its intensity was such that it eclipsed the sun for a short period of time, and within that time, vivid light displays, including bursts of red, green and purple, erupted over the globe. Additionally, it had the effect of supercharging telegraph cables, which startled operators, caused telegraph paper to catch fire, and, in certain instances, continued to send messages even after the batteries were removed. Even though solar material eruptions do occur on a regular basis, none have been as large as the one in 1859. Conversely, what would happen if one did? Smaller solar flare outbursts have given us some clues. These explosions created clouds of charged particles that have slammed into Earth's magnetic field, causing it to tremble in what scientists term a geomagnetic storm. For instance, in February 2011, commercial flights and ships that depend on GPS navigation systems may have been in for a world of hurt when a solar storm briefly disrupted GPS signals. Over a decade afterward, on April 21st, 2023, a strong solar event sent a fast-moving burst of plasma toward Earth, causing a severe geomagnetic storm two days later. Satellites, electrical grids and communication networks were all negatively impacted by this storm. Stunning aurora borealis were also a result. This was the third big solar storm this cycle, with similar occurrences in 2021 and earlier in 2023 also being monitored by NOAA's Diaskova mission. Electronics, radio waves and satellite signals would all be disrupted if an X-ray and ultraviolet burst from a solar flare of Carrington-sized magnitude were to strike Earth today. Furthermore, it would trigger a solar radiation storm, which, without adequate protective gear and the shielding effect of Earth's atmosphere, might be fatal to astronauts. The next step would be for the cloud of charged particles, which is the coronal mass ejection, to collide with the Earth's magnetic field. Everything from cars to planes to cell phones and computers would go down the drain if this happened. Many essential daily activities would be rendered impossible as cities experienced power outages that might last weeks or even months. For instance, you could go to a gas station and fill up. A satellite transaction is required to pay for even a small amount of gas using a credit or debit card, and it would be impossible to create one. In February 2022, SpaceX saw the devastating effects of space weather firsthand when a geomagnetic storm destroyed 40 Starlink satellites with a combined value of more than $50 million. Released into extremely low altitude orbits, between 60 and 120 miles, the Starlink satellites use their onboard motors to overcome drag and reach a final altitude of approximately 350 miles. In the event of a geomagnetic storm, the Earth's atmosphere absorbs the storm's energy, gets hotter and expands upwards, creating a denser thermosphere that stretches from around 50 miles to about 600 miles above the surface of the planet. Since a denser thermosphere means more drag, satellites can encounter problems such as the batch of Starlink satellites that were released, which started to fall back to Earth and eventually burn up in the atmosphere due to the increased drag. Scientists research solar wind to enhance space weather forecasts and get a better understanding of the space weather environment. Since solar weather events can have extremely costly repercussions, it is crucial to advance our knowledge of and ability to anticipate these phenomena. While space weather is inevitable, we can take appropriate measures to protect ourselves. Research into solar wind and other solar system phenomena is the focus of heliophysics missions. The National Aeronautics and Space Administration states that these missions will seek to study the formation of planetary atmospheres, the effects of space weather on humans and Earth-based technologies, and the physical characteristics of our interplanetary neighbours. The solar environment is complex, which is why our Sun and its behaviour are the focus of an entire fleet of space missions. Scientists are rushing to create a system to detect solar flares and an early warning system in anticipation of their possible impact on Earth, just as their forebears learned to predict deadly tornadoes and other meteorological phenomena. One day, 
solar flare warnings could be added to the list of weather alerts that include hurricane warnings and thunderstorm watches. It goes without saying that we humans are incredibly fortunate to have that solar windshield. The heliosphere, which is supplied by the Sun, prevents 70% of the interstellar cosmic rays from reaching Earth. Without the heliosphere, these rays would otherwise charge in and interact with us, leading to a significant increase in the radiation that we would absorb. Given that Voyager 2 and even Voyager 1, which was launched in 1977, survived, it appears that our interstellar ships wouldn't be too negatively impacted by this wall of hot plasma. However, it is unclear how difficult this wall will make interstellar travel once we decide to go beyond Mars and eventually leave our solar system. More so, the effects of the plasma wall on living organisms are yet unknown. Whatever the case may be, the finding is thrilling because it marks the cosmic shoreline, the boundary between our solar system's environment and the enormous expanse of interstellar space. Thanks for watching another episode of Voyager. While you're still here, make sure to click the video on your screen for more mind-blowing videos about space.